here's a fine mix on today. First one I see is on the right. It's called an El Copy. And even though the El Copy does have some black and white stripes on its legs, it's not related to the zebra. It's actually most closely related to the giraffe. So we know that based off of its skull structure, the ossicones on its head and its prehensile tongue. The word prehensile just means fingers. So the okapi and the giraffe, they both use their tongues like fingers to grab onto leaves and branches and other vegetation. As we do continue making our way through the forest, we're going to see what other animals we might be able to find. Up. To continue making our way through the forest, we're going to see what other animals we might be able to find up ahead of us. We're going to check across that water just in case there is anything over there. I see a black rhino. It's not moving around. It looks kind of like a big boulder with clay on it. The black rhinoceros, it's actually the smallest of the three African rhinos. They only weigh about 3,000 pounds. There's another one laying right in front of the cliff here. With those black rhinos, they do have pointed prehensile upper lips that they use like fingers to grab onto leaves and foliage here in the forest. And over on your right, you're going to see a black and white bird laying in those bushes. It's a saddle-built stork. It doesn't have very long legs, but it also has a nine-foot wingspan, which is about the width of the canopy over your head. And then if you keep your eye on the right, up on those hills, those dark brown animals, they're called bongos. Both male and female bongos have horns to point backwards on their head. That helps them run through the forest without getting caught on any low-hanging branches or shrubs. Their horns actually push those branches out of the way, so it greatly improves their speed and their stealth, and because of that, they're known as the ghost of the forest. But as we start making our way into near the river, over on your left, those light brown animals there, they're called the greater kudu. The two I see are females. They don't have any horns. And the greater kudu, it does also use its large scoop of ears to navigate through the forest rather than relying on its eyesight. We're moving a lot closer toward the Sapi River right now. We're going to look for some aquatic and semi-aquatic animals together. I do already see some pink backed pelicans up on the river bank. The pink backed pelican, it does of course get its name from the pink color of the skin on its back. And pelicans, they're omnivores, which means that they eat plants, animals, and just about anything else that fits inside their bills. And as we do continue along, I'm going to keep my eye on the water here on the left. Looking for some movement shadows, anything like that under the water that could suggest an animal beneath the surface. It's also possible if these animals have moved a bit further down the river. I'll keep my eye out for them just the same. I do yes. see them in this deeper water here. Not you might see a hippo. Yes, and the hippopotamus, it's nocturnal. It spends most of its day underwater sleeping. But much easier for us to see. These are Nile crocodiles. And the Nile crocodile, if you grow to be about 16 feet in length, they bite with a force of 2,000 pounds per square inch. And I do need everyone to stay fully seated for me throughout the entire safari today. So you might notice that crocodile out there that looks like it's smiling at us. It's actually how it cools off. Nile crocodiles, they don't have sweat glands, so the easiest way for them to cool down is to open their mouth and release all the hot air, kind of like a dog panting, but with a lot more teeth. Grasslands. Those grasses are typically quite a bit shorter than the grass we've seen in the forest. The trees are also usually spread further apart with higher canopies around 18 to 20 feet or taller. And the combination of short grass and tall sparse trees means that the animals that call the savanna home, they have less places to hide and camouflage. So instead they're going to rely more heavily on their speed and agility to escape from predators. Well, that's not to say these animals can't camouflage, of course they still can. 
They just use slightly different techniques than those animals we saw in the forest. And once we get to the bottom of this hill, the first animals we're going to see are some red and white animals with really big horns. They're called Ancoli cattle. Ancoli cattle's horns can reach about six feet across and they are filled with a honeycomb structure that helps them circulate their blood and regulate their temperature. And the Ancoli, it's also known as the Watusi cattle, after the Watusi people in Africa that helped to domesticate them. These are actually the only domestic species that we have in all of Harambe. We're going to keep moving forward. I think we have a pretty good chance of seeing some more animals toward the end of this clearing here. <laughs> Over on your left hand side, friends, you're going to see a cave. And on the back side of the cave on that hill, I do see quite a few African painted dogs. African painted dogs. They are the most successful hunters in Africa. They have success rates usually between 80 and 90%. And that's because they hunt in packs and they take turns chasing their prey until it simply just falls over from exhaustion. But teamwork does make the dream work and they are very, very good at what they do. Now up ahead of us, I do see quite a bit of movement. I see a lot of species up ahead. The dark brown antelope with the really long pointed horns, they're called sable antelope. And sable antelope, they get their name from the sable color of their fur. They have long pointed horns that are angled just slightly backwards for self-defense from predators. It looks like they're hanging out near a bunch of wildebeest. Wildebeest travel in herds of 10 to 1,000 together at once, which does of course make them the largest herding animal in the world aside from us humans. And a herd of wildebeest, it is called a confusion. <laughs> Yeah. It looks like this wildebeest here really wants to cross the road in front of us, so we're going to go ahead and let it. <laughs> and of course, friends, you may have also seen those giraffe all around us. They are Maasai giraffe. Across the road. Yeah. When one moved, they all moved. Now the last one's like, okay, I guess I'll come to. <laughs> Look at this. You know, Masai giraffe, they are known for their small spots. Those spots, they have a rough, jagged edges, as you can see. The Masai, specifically, it is also the largest of the giraffe species. They're born at about six feet tall and they reach 18 to 20 feet by adulthood. <laughs> That's the perfect height to grab onto tall tree canopies out here on the savannah. It looks like everyone wants to cross today, so we are just gonna keep letting them cross and then we'll be back on the move together. There's a couple more Maasai's coming down the hill. Looks like they are looking for a snack today. Thank you. 
about a flock of flamingo like this one. It's called a flamboyance. And all of those yeah. great flamingos in the flamboyance are baby flamingos. It normally takes one to two years for the beta carotene from the shrimp in their diets to turn their feathers pink. So we know any flamingo with gray feathers is less than a year or two old. And friends, this right here, this is my favorite view in all of Harambe. With the flamingos, the palm trees, the water, the baobab tree, and all of those elements. I think it's beautiful. But we're going to continue our safari. There's lots of other beautiful sights up ahead as well. Probably a lot of animals for us to find together too. It uh, does look like the hood wallow is pretty quiet at the moment. I'm sure you notice that our animals, they do get to roam around. They get to choose where they want to hang out. They can cross the road even. So sometimes that does mean that we have to drive for a little while before we find that next species. But I think usually they're not too far away. So I'm just going to move around these mud wallows. It does look like I'm seeing an animal. It's going to be up ahead on our left. There's kind of a hill right in front of us. And up on top of that hill, I do see a few cheetahs. They're laying right before the start of the grass line. Cheetahs, they are known for their speed. They're very, very fast. They can go from zero miles per hour to 60 miles per hour in just a few seconds. But they do also have very, very good eyesight, and that's largely due to the black markings around their eyes. They help redirect sunlight, kind of like athletes that wear eye black. But because of those markings, cheetahs, they're able to visually track and catch up with their prey, even while the sun is out. And that does make them very unique from other big cats because they like to hunt during the day, whereas most big cats do prefer to hunt at night when they have a visual advantage. Yeah, this rock formation here on our left, it's called a kofi. Sometimes we see animals on the kofis. This side it looked pretty and quiet today. But we'll go check out that other side just in case we can find anything hanging out over there. It does look like our lions are out in the front of the kofis. I see two lionesses and our male hanging out on top of those rocks. And they are all sleeping. That's because lions are nocturnal. During the day, lions, they can only see as well as us humans, but at night they can actually see about six times better than us, so they have quite the advantage at night. And usually it's going to be those lionesses that go out hunting, the male lion, he's going to stay back and guard over their cubs and their territory. But if you are still here a little bit closer to no, sunset, keep an ear open that. for those lions. A lion roar can be heard from up to five to miles to away. To and over on your left, just past that bone log, I see some warthogs. Warthogs are the largest burrowing mammals in the world. You can see their burrows all along the ditch line. They use their curved tusks to dig out their burrow, and then they typically back in. That way their tusks face outwards. No one tries to sleep over with them. This little antelope that's hanging out right by the road on our left population could recover and rebound. And over the last 120 years, we've worked really hard on Bonte Bot conservation. So now there's almost 3,000 of them all around the world in wildlife reserves like Harambe. And I think that that's so inspiring because if one person could save the Bonte Bot species, think how much a trunk full of us can do for our favorite animals as well. And speaking of those animals here on our left, these are Nigerian dwarf goats. They have a very high quality milk that's excellent for drinking and making cheeses. That's great for us to bring back toward the village. We can also let the warden know that their goats are doing quite well today. They're very active. All around the yard, on the roof, they were in the truck. It's kind of everywhere. We have plenty of other species for you to discover yourself as well. It is a 15 to 20 minute self-guided trail, wheelchair and stroller accessible for everyone. And it's really easy to get there from the safari. When you exit off of my truck, if you take a right, you're going to be heading straight into Gorilla Falls. But if you prefer not to visit right away, you can take a left instead. That's going to bring you back down the hill toward the village where you can find food, restrooms, and anything else you might be looking for today. But of course, 
I would take that right. I do love to see those animals. And we are getting pretty close to the dock. If I have any wilderness explorers on board, the name of this truck is Simba One. Simba is Swahili for lion, and one is English for the number one. So that'll be your code word to pick up your badge on the trail as you're exiting.